Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our third installment of the Summer Meals webinar, Activities with Meals, with Best Practices from the Field. And uh, I'm here in the uh, office today with my, uh, excuse me, my name is Derek Lambert uh, with Hunger Free Vermont and I'm here with Nancy Lewis from the Vermont Agency of Education. And we have a Busy lineup today, Nancy. We've got folks from Waterbury Parks and Recreation, the Children's Literacy Foundation, uh, the Barton Public Library, and we'll also be receiving information from the New England Dairy and Food Council. And uh, we will actually have, I'll, I'll keep it a bit of a secret right now, but we've got information about a grant opportunity here in Vermont. So stay tuned for that. Uh, so Nancy, thanks for joining. Oh, today. you're welcome. I'm all ears today. I'm the the very least important person. I'm, I'm um, really happy to see all these activities folks on the line with us. Great. So um, just a quick housekeeping note about using your webinar technology and how to participate. You likely see a, um, you likely see a task bar uh, link, link to the webinar technology. There are options for audio. Uh, I'd like to note that you can use your telephone to call in. That's how Nancy and I are speaking to you today is on speakerphone. There also is an option for mic and speakers. So if you're having a problem or if you're not happy with the quality of the sound, I just want you to be aware of those two options for sound. Uh, make sure if you dial in to, to make note of the access code and audio pin that will allow you to sign in. Uh, if you have a question, you can type it in. If you want to raise your hand, uh, that's also a good way to let, get our attention. Actually, I'm just going to ask everyone, I know we had a problem with the sound last time. If you can hear me. Please click to raise your hand so we can know that everyone hears us out there. Okay. Please click to raise your hand. This is also a good exercise where we're figuring, getting, using this technology. I've, I've been tricked by it a time or two, so. How, how would they know to raise their hand? What do they click on? They click right there on the left-hand side. You've got a raise hand oh, button. Oh, yeah, you've got yeah. it. Uh, so, okay, I see a lot of hands lot raised. Of hands. Great. A lot of hands. Okay. Pretty good. Much you, more than not. Yeah. So you guys can put them back down if you want. Uh, thank you so much. Good to know everybody here is out there. Uh, and once again, if you have specific questions, let us know. Um, so we'll move on. Uh, if you have a problem that doesn't seem to be working, one way also is to log out of the webinar and to log back in. Sometimes that can resolve any questions or problems you might be experiencing. Uh, so once again, me and uh, myself, uh, we are uh, the usual suspects on this. So we don't, I don't guess we don't need too much uh, of an introduction. But I would like to note our three guest speakers today. Uh, Jana Brown, manager from the Children's Literacy Foundation. Hello out there, Jana. Uh, hi, Derek. Uh, so glad to be with you all today. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, um, and then we also have Chad Ummel. He is the Recreation Director at Waterbury Recreation. Chad, thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon, and thanks for having us on a cold day and not the thaw we enjoyed yesterday. Great. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. have been indoors today. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. I think we all are a little bit more today. Uh, thank you, Chad. And then also we have uh, Frank Fisher, who is a semi-retired educator, though uh, to hear him tell it, I, don't, I think he stays quite busy. He is in, involved in the Summer Meals and Activity Program at Barton Senior Center. Frank, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Chad. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, Derek, so, I'm sorry. That's all right. No problem. Uh, we've got a lot of people on the call today. So thank you, Frank, for joining. Uh, I'm going to mute the lines briefly, um, and we will open up these lines at different times to make sure everyone has a chance. Um, just want to be clear about our webinar objectives today. They're to learn about the best practices to integrate activities with meals to maximize participation, uh, learning about opportunities for your program to receive support from statewide and regional organizations that work with summer meal sites and sponsors, and we want to begin thinking about uh, next steps and brainstorm ways to reach out to partners and get the ball rolling because, as you know, uh, we're here in mid-March. We are ramping up into uh, the full summer planning season. And I would like to start today uh, with a poll question. I'm going to ask everyone. Uh, my first question is, do, you, do your summer meal sites currently offer activities? So uh, if you don't mind, please take a moment, have a look at the um, options that we have here. No, we don't offer any activities at all. Yes some of the time with meals, and yes, everyday meals are served. So I'm going to give folks a few more minutes, and we will have a look. 
So our summer meal sites currently uh, offering activities of some sort. So wait another five seconds or so, and then we will have a look at it. Okay. So we're going to share. And what we see here is that 80% of uh, sites are serving meals alongside activities every day. So that's a good thing. That's what we want to see. Yeah, so we've got 20, no, none at all. We know there can be a lot of reasons for that. We know there are some challenges that folks can encounter. Uh, but one of the things we want to do today is think about how we can make sure that everyone who's offering a meal program uh, has access to resources that would allow them to provide activities. Because you know, Nancy, we find that's the most successful way to bring kids to the site. Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. It's, it is a cost for families to get to the site, so they want to be motivated. The kids want to be motivated. Sometimes it takes kids bugging their parents to get them to the site. So, um, yeah, it's, it's all about having fun. Great. So we will be working on that today. Thanks, everyone, for uh, sharing their thoughts on that. And today we want to really, you know, hammer home that meals and activities are a natural connection. Uh, the children at greatest risk for summer learning loss are, in many cases, the same children children that are at the greatest risk for adverse health outcomes during the summer months. So what we're talking about is the summer slide where we know that children who have unequal access to enrichment activities in the summertime come back to school less prepared than their peers. Uh, and then we have child hunger and unhealthy weight gain, which, uh, you know, somewhat ironically, Nancy, we don't always think about this, those two things can exist in the same child. The child can be hungry and experiencing unhealthy weight gain. Yeah, yeah. It's, um yeah, I think that's a new learning we've had in, in mm -hmm. recent years. You look at people and you think they're overeating, but that doesn't mean they're eating foods that are good for them and that are going to help their brain development mm -hmm. or help them be active. Right. And and those and those kinds of good those kinds of foods that would contribute to that are obviously more expensive in many cases. And so that you know being able to provide meals is a benefit to the children and then also to the families. Well, it, and it could be or it could be just cultural, and yeah. that's not the norm for the family. So summer foods sites, especially those that are working with um, local um, fresh grown foods, could be learning opportunities that then extend further into the family and create a new culture change there. So there are real opportunities around um, nutrition and some food. And we know that some of the key factors that contribute to increased risk for obesity and food insecurity are the setting and structure of summer care arrangements, access to summer meals, uh, eating habits, and the amount and intensity of physical activity. And the reality is that a successful summer meal activity program can offset a lot of those consequences. So that's why we're here today. Uh, and we want to think about ways to create events and activities or to connect to events and activities. And I would say in many cases, for a summer meal provider, uh, the best really uh, step that you can take is to figure out who can I connect with. Uh, and so we want to think about, you know, how can we take the initiative to boost participation? Uh, some of the ways that we can do that are to think about uh, leveraging partnerships for kickoff events. Uh, we know there are organizations such as the New England Food and Dairy Council that is uh, going to be, we'll be talking about later on. They have some resources, they have some activities that they can leverage uh, for sites that are interested in kickoff activities. Uh, libraries can be brought in. In many cases, they're wanting to raise awareness about their reading programs. Rec programs uh, that offer activities throughout the summer may be trying to increase enrollment. So there are lots of different connections. I know in Chelsea, which is a very small town, last year before last, they had the fire truck come up one day. And the, the fire truck came in. The kids loved that. They let them have a tour of the truck. Uh, and so some of these, these activities um, that would really bring in kids and raise awareness and interest in the program uh, don't necessarily cost a lot of money, Nancy. There can be some really creative, uh, really creative strategies. And I think, I, as I was telling you, Derek, I was just at a, a regional in Boston looking at multiple states and what the different partners and players do there. And there's also this concept of blitzes. So we've got kickoff events, and you can get reimbursed if you have just a one-day event and you're feeding kids. So kind of think creatively about that. But then I think it was Connecticut had some statistics about blitzes. So they did these special events during the summer to sort of remind people. And what it did was it increased participation. So maybe things started waning at sites and not so many kids were showing up. And then they do an uplift event. Mm -hmm. And then it, it would kind of remind the community, refresh the uh, program, and participation would increase, which of course then increases revenue. So there's that other concept too now I'm going to be thinking about, which is split. What's with it? And you know, another thing, and I'm sure we'll hear more from the Children's Literacy Foundation, but they also have some events that they may have available. Uh, where there can be on-site readings and book giveaways. So 
These kinds of things, as Nancy mentioned, the kickoff event at the beginning of the year is a very good idea. There can be kind of a mid-season event in the summertime to make sure kids still know about it. Uh, but that really allows you to raise the visibility of the program. Uh, and another, another real key is to minimize cost and to leverage partnerships. Uh, you know, reach out to groups that provide activities or enrichment that do not currently provide meals. Uh, we're going to hear a few examples here in a minute, but just in general, I would like to, to, to highlight libraries, reg departments, municipal pools, uh, any day camps that operate in and around the area. These are great places to connect, and, and you may even want to just take, a, take time to think outside the box, and that's where Nancy and myself can be helpful to think about, are there opportunities in places like senior centers, at food shelves, or in state parks, local beaches and campgrounds? There are many places where uh, meals uh, would have a willing audience. There can be kids that could participate. Uh, you just kind of have to scout out the community and figure out what's out there, Nancy. And, and I know that we've seen a lot of really creative strategies so far in our state. Yeah, and I was, again, thinking about, while well, I'm thinking about Morris Town and their, um, their songwriting. So you may find when you're going for volunteers, multiple, you know, having a regular um, schedule might be too much for somebody, but maybe you have an artist that wants to come in and visit and provide music one day. So again, thinking kind of broadly about all the different ways that you could be providing activities for kids. That's great. And, and while we're thinking about this, I'd like to make it uh, more tangible and introduce uh, one of our, our first speaker today. Chad Ummel is the Recreation Director at Waterbury uh, Recreation. And he uh, actually instituted a summer meal program alongside his recreation uh, activities last summer. Was their first year as a summer meal site. They served a lot of folks. Actually, uh, their site was highlighted uh, by the by Governor Shumlin last summer, so got some exposure uh, and was very successful. He partnered with Barry Supervisory Union to receive meals and partnered with a local uh, a church group to arrange transportation from the meal from the kitchen to the meal site each day. Uh, and Chad, if, if you have a moment, I, I, I have your line open there. Would you mind just going in and telling us a little bit about how that connection was made and, and what it looked like for your program this past year? Certainly, I'd be happy to, and to begin by stating how excited we are to participate once more. The programs that we ran was a traditional summer day camp that served about 80 to 100 children per day that were enrolled at the recreational programs aside a swimming pool, tennis courts, playground, etc. The campers, just like in any other summer day camp, came for structured activities at the pool. We had athletics, sports activities as well. But for the first time, we were able to serve as an open site. So not only did all of our campers be, were able to participate in the program, the summer lunch program, but we were also able to open it to the entire community. Prior to the lunch program, all of the kids in the past brought their sack lunches. A local church group had volunteered and prepared some sack lunches for children that might have been in need. They heard about your programs and introduced us to each other. We became involved then with the summer meals and got connected with George through this same church organization. They set up a sign-up genius. It was an online, a very common format that allows for volunteers to register for individual slots or chores. We put one slot for each day, and the drivers that would then volunteer went to Barry to pick the food up and brought it to our park. We were able to serve it daily, breakfast and lunch, and uh, we did offer activities alongside. We were fortunate not many programs have the same facilities that we were able to actually have the meal served next to the swimming pool. It was already an automatic draw for children, but we did some games and activities to help not only draw more children in, but to raise the visibility and interest in the community. The notable activity that we hosted was what we titled, Come for Free Lunch, Take Home a Garden. And throughout the entire summer, our children were encouraged to compost what little remnants of their lunches remained and we use that medium to plant seedlings inside the recycled milk and juice cartons from the same lunch program. So it was a lot of fun and the kids were able to see things come full circle. They were able to plant vegetables within the soil that they produced through their food waste inside a carton that they had recycled from the same lunch program. So that was a very fun and enjoyable activity. The kids still tell me about the potatoes that they grew that day. So that was a fun one. 
Another success that we enjoyed was partnering with local restaurants in town who gave us very nominal but enjoyable gift certificates. So each day we gave away a slice of pizza or a free bagel or a hot dog from one of the local restaurants. And we put a gold sticker randomly on the bottom of one of the children's trays hidden within the lot. And as they filed through, they were very excited to be getting their free lunches, but they lift their trays high above their head to see if they had found the golden sticker and won that day's prize. So that not only helped generate a lot of interest and draw the kids over to the, the summer lunch program, but it really did help foster a relationship with the community. It raised awareness throughout the whole area of what we were offering. We're hoping to do something very similar again this year. So we're really looking forward to this summer. Uh, we're not planning on too many changes. We're expecting the program to increase. We're mm -hmm. anticipating more food served because of basically the continuity that we're going to be able to offer last being our first year. This year we know there's going to be more awareness and hopefully more participation. So really looking forward to it once more. So Chad, this is Nancy. I um, Could you... Talk a little bit about um, how the coordination worked with um, George Mackey and the Berry Supervisory Union. How was it to organize for him to develop the meals for you? And was there any pass-through of money, or was it just free food delivered to you? There was no exchange of money. In, in a word, the entire process was simply seamless. As we worked with George, he made it so simple and so easy that I don't understand why it wasn't begun in our community much sooner. <laughs> Honestly, it's just a wonderful program. Working with George, uh, again, we just, the possibilities were simply endless. We corresponded with George from the onset as well as Derek there who served as the uh, facilitator and made sure that we went through the procedures which were very basic. The training was informative but brief. It was a very easy process. That's great, Chad. One of the things you mentioned that uh we had not said earlier in the webinar, and I think it's great, is the idea of having incentives for children to participate, giveaways, you know, things that can be even very small but can create some excitement around the program that make kids excited about getting, you know, going through the line, taking part. Um, that's a great thing. And how did, that, how did that partnership come about, the giveaway program you mentioned? The small incentive program, just giving away the gift certificates, was born of our sign-up genius that we posted on Facebook and email and front porch forums simply looking for volunteer drivers to go pick the food up and bring back. It got it raised the awareness among some of the local businesses who wanted to participate and help in some way. And it was our idea that they could just give us a few token prizes that we could then yes use as an incentive and just make it more exciting for the kids to come through the lines. So it was not our idea, it was the idea of the local businesses. I think that that's really wonderful and I think uh you know, that kind of thing. I think that, to your point, when you let folks in the community know what's going on, uh, there can be some excitement around it, and really organizations want to get involved. And I'll, um, I'll broaden the thinking a little bit. This is Nancy again in our regional meeting that we were hearing from what some other states do. Um, <clears throat> some places put a little, um, a little more formality almost to the business um, participation in that they make some trade-off to say, well, gee, if you will participate and, you know, help us out, we'll put your logo on our materials, and hey, can we count on you next year? We're producing these materials. So doing a little more like, hey, you know, if you're going to, you know, we will give you this in return, sort of a, a more formal exchange for advertising. So that's just something to think about to see if that would be helpful to get firms to commit and maybe even commit for multiple years to know that they're going to, their logo is going to be, or, you know, their material is going to be associated with your work. That's a good point, Nancy. That's great. Chad, thank you so much. This is, this is a great uh, example, I think, of really just connecting. George had a, a large and growing meal program. Obviously, you have a strong rec uh, program that's available, and uh, this sort of thing really makes a lot of sense because everyone, Nancy, is focusing on what they're good at. You know, the, rec you know, the recreation, the activity portion is there, the meals are being brought in. Uh, and George, the summer meal sponsor, he's not having to figure out the, meal, the activity part. He's That's just right. taking meals. That's right. So it makes it easy to partner when you're really using people's strengths. And, it, and bottom line, everybody is interested in having a healthy community. So don't um, 
you know, realize that, that it's maybe you're not asking for too much when you're asking things from people because everybody wants the same thing for these kids. Mm, that's, that's great. Well, Chad, once again, thank you. If you want to hang around on the line, I'm not sure what your schedule looks like. We will have a question and answer period later on. Uh, I'd like to trans transition uh, to speak about the Barton Library and Senior Center. This was a, uh, a new uh, site, new collaboration this past year. Uh, the Barton Senior Center was a summer meal site. Uh, that had worked with the library. And once again, Frank Fisher, just to give you folks a little bit of, a, of a, uh, an introduction, is a, quote, semi-retired educator who has a history of working uh, in his career with at-risk youth. He is currently or has recently been a volunteer with the Fairbanks Museum and the Peachum Observatory and uh, was instrumental in helping organize the program that operated in conjunction with the library and the senior center. So Frank, if you can hear me, take it away. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, nope. our, our program uh, initially started out with uh, a collaboration between the Barton Public Library staff and uh, a colleague educator that was running a, uh, uh, a reading program for young people. And he and I uh, collaborated and put together a program in conjunction with our uh, summer meals uh, for for young people at the Barton Senior Center. And uh, in the afternoon when the meals were served, uh, our young people came uh, to the Barton Senior Center. And it was a wonderful opportunity for uh, this intergenerational mix. Uh, and it brought a lot of pleasure to our senior population to have young people coming in on a regular basis. And uh, one of the activities, uh, the main activity that we were involved in uh, was based on uh, science, technology, engineering, and uh, math programs that our schools are uh, pushing for uh, more than ever uh, these days. And in conjunction with the uh, folks at the uh, Peachum Observatory, I, I'm working as a uh, a, a docent at large, and uh, what I try to do is recruit young people, uh, 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 youth organizations uh, such as Boy Scout troops or uh, science classes from various uh, uh, rural school districts to participate at the Peachum Observatory. So as, as a docent for the observatory, uh, we decided, my, my uh, teacher colleague and I, we decided that we would run an astronomy-based uh, activities program where our students were doing hands-on activities, making models of the solar system, and uh, doing uh, activities uh, such as that, uh, and also going out in the evenings at their homes in their backyards with their friends uh, and making observations of the night sky and coming back the next day and doing artwork uh, based on what they saw in the night sky the night before. And uh, the program, it, it ranged, uh, the numbers of students, that, the numbers of young people that came in ranged from uh, 22 initially, uh, showed a great deal of interest, and uh, at times it fluctuated. Sometimes we had as few as five, and sometimes, and sometimes as I said, as many as 20 or 22. And a lot of times, the parents uh, got some feedback from their children and came along uh, with their children uh, to the program. And and one of the uh, one of the activities that uh, we f we finished up with was uh, held at the Barton Public Library. And one of the uh, docents at the Peachum Observatory brought a solar telescope to the grounds. Uh, of the public library on a bright sunny day. Uh, we had this special telescope set up uh, for making observations of the sun. And we had uh, 18, 18 young people showed up with their parents. So we had quite a crowd out on the front lawn. And uh, each one of our uh, young people and the parents had a chance to take a look at the sun uh, and, and, and see it uh, without hurting their eyes, of course. Uh, the special telescope was made for uh, observing the sun and we were able to spot uh, solar prominences and uh, all kinds of activities uh, on the sun. And, and that was, uh, that was a, a culminating event uh, at, at the uh, Barton Public Library. 
but as far as the mule site uh, goes, uh, the activities uh, on on the uh, on the most part were based on uh, science-based uh, astronomy, and uh, our young people really took a, a great amount of interest in going out at night and taking a look at the night sky and relating back to us what they saw uh, the next day. So it it was it was a lot of fun for uh, all of us, and uh, we we're looking forward to doing it again. The meals that were served were uh, were really uh, well prepared meals that we serve on a regular basis here at the Barton Senior Center, and uh, I think the uh, the activity that took place between uh, the young people and the and the senior population was really a highlight of each each day that we had the activity. It was it was just a wonderful experience for all those involved. It sounds like, you know, it sounds like those were fascinating activities, and, and I can only imagine that the fact that you were able to offer activities and opportunities for kids and families like that must have been a really big part of the success of the meal program as well. It sounds like there was really a, a tight connection, not only between the meal program uh, and the people working on that side, but it sounds like the library was an equal partner in a lot of what you were trying to do there. Yeah, we have, we have a wonderful, wonderful relationship with, with the folks here at the Barton uh, Barton Public Library, and uh, our students, uh, our young people, uh, as part of their activity, they made a, a beautiful chart of the night sky. It was about uh, five feet high and ten feet wide, and they put uh, little pieces of artwork and uh, illustrations of observations that they made of the night sky on our board, and we took it over to the public library uh, for display so that the the public in general would have an opportunity to see the work that our kids did, and it, it was uh, it was really a a, 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 a well organized and well received uh, activity. That's great. And you know, Nancy, what I'm thinking about as well as Frank mentioned, the fact that the senior center already provided meals meant that they didn't have to come up with something completely different to offer kids meals. No, the senior sites are a great place to also feed the kids because the senior centers already follow a meal pattern, have to do documentation to get federal funding for their program. So it's not that big a leap for them. It's not as big a learning curve. It's very familiar. When they look at our meal patterns, they say, oh yeah, we have to do that anyways. And, and again, that interaction between the other people in the community, different ages, it's so so rich there. So yeah, we've had, um, we've had some growth in the yeah, senior centers, yeah. it's been a good thing. Yeah, there were, there were actually six of them operating in Vermont last year. We hope to see uh, as many or more this year. Uh, Frank, thank you, thank you so much for sharing your experience at the library and with the senior center. Uh, once again, um, we will open it up for questions later. If you're able to hang around, that would be great. Um, yeah, I would, I would just like to say one thing. Uh, the, 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 folks at the, the folks at the Peachum Observatory, uh, if you wanted to contact them, their, web, their uh, website is uh, nkaf.org. That's Northeast Kingdom Astronomy Foundation. And you can read about our mission statement at the observatory and perhaps get other young people involved in learning uh, more about astronomy. That's great. Thank you so much, Frank, for um, the, all of that information and, and for the work that you do. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you as well. So we're going to um, also, you know, those are a lot of, community supports that we see there. We see a lot of folks in the community making those connections, Nancy, to be able to, to stretch their efforts further than they'd be able to do on their own. We also want to make sure people know that there is there's external support available as well, and that there are organizations active in Vermont that provide support for summer meal and activity programs. There are a number of, of them. We certainly are not exhausting the opportunities today, but uh, given the time constraints and, and the opportunities that have presented themselves, we're going to focus on the Children's Literacy Foundation, the New England uh, Dairy and Food Council, uh, and then we're going to share some information about grant funding from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So uh, I know Jana Brown is out there. She's the program manager for the Children's Literacy Foundation. Uh, Jana, would you want to uh, speak about some of the opportunities that your program can offer to uh, meal side? Oh, sure, absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy to be here to talk to you a little bit about the Children's Literacy Foundation summer programming. Each summer, we have a grant opportunity called the Summer Readers Grant with Cliff. Um, and through that grant, we serve thousands of children all across Vermont and New Hampshire during the summertime to help combat that summer slide, which I think Derek had mentioned earlier in the webinar. 
Um, so for purposes of this particular webinar, focusing in on Vermont, um, across both states last summer we served um, for over 4,000 children just with our Summer Readers Grant. Um, and that was across 31 sites here in the state of Vermont. So in general, for those of you who might not be familiar with our organization, we are a nonprofit and our mission is to inspire a love of reading and writing among um, children across Vermont and New Hampshire who are low income or otherwise at risk for growing up with low literacy skills. And our target audience is birth through age 12. And so I think on the next slide there's a little bit uh, more specific information about our Summer Readers Grant. As I was mentioning earlier, it's designed to help combat that summer slide. And our goal during the summer with our Summer Readers Grant is to basically meet kids where they are gathering throughout the summer. And so our partnership with Summer Food sites across Vermont is really a natural alliance for us. And in fact, last year out of the 31 sites that we visited in Vermont, a very high percentage of those were also summer meal sites. So it's just a, a, very, a natural partnership that I think works really well for us and uh, really well for those summer meal sites as well. And so we visited, in addition to nutrition programs, we also visit summer camps, both sleepaway camps and day camps, uh, parks and rec departments, library programs all across Vermont, uh, school-based summer programming. Um, so we really are reaching um, a, a wide variety in terms of the types of sites that we're visiting. And basically, our summer literacy programming includes, through our Summer Readers Grant, that includes a professional storytelling presentation by one of our fabulous Cliff presenters, as well as a book giveaway, which is a huge draw for kids. Uh, at each of our events, kids um, select two brand new high quality books to take home and keep as part of their own personal home library. And so that's a, that's a huge draw for our events, um, something that the kids obviously love. and meets our goals of getting them excited about reading uh, during the school vacation. So, and I think on this next slide, um, so if you check out our website, www.cliffonline.org, you will find the eligibility requirements for our Summer Readers Grant. Um, you'll also see my contact information on the bottom of that slide. I'm absolutely happy to answer questions at any time, um, either by phone or email. So. Um, you know, that just sets out our very basic qualifications for the Summer Readers Grant. Um, because we try to direct our resources to the sites and the children that need it most, we ask that a minimum of 35% of the children that are served through a particular organization or, or program qualify either for free or reduced lunch, some type of reduced program tuition, or, or a scholarship to attend that particular program. So again, I, I absolutely encourage everyone to reach out if they have questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Jana. I have a quick question. If, if I'm a summer meal site or a sponsor uh, and I would love to get you folks to come do a reading, it sounds really exciting, and I want to do this um, sometime in the summer, maybe as early as June, is it too late to apply? What's the timeline for uh, oh. application and, and, and actually receiving uh, uh, an award? Okay, great question, Derek. So um, actually we began accepting applications at the beginning of this month. So. Um, basically, sites are absolutely encouraged to apply now and apply early, and we will be reviewing those applications and making decisions on a rolling basis um, starting in March. Okay, so now's the time is what I'm hearing. Absolutely. That's great. Is there is there an electronic application that you could send? I can maybe send that around with the notes to this webinar. Oh, absolutely. It's available on our website, and I will also email it directly to you so that if you wanted to email that out to the to the wider list, that would be fantastic. I'd love to do that. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, and once again, uh, you know, Nancy, I, I know in speaking with Jenna in the past, and she shared information about some of the locations that they were at last year, there are already lots of summer meal sites taking advantage of this. And I'm hearing, but I'm hearing not all, so it makes exactly. me wonder, um, because I think there's a natural connection, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the those sites that if, if they're either not in low-income areas, although her program matches to low income, mm -hmm. what's happening with the food, it might be um, if kids aren't eating that they can't even absorb the, the reading. So it's a national uh, natural partnership for to have the food with the learning activities mm -hmm. to help kids settle down and, and attend yeah. to the learning at hand. And getting two free books, that's great. So mm -hmm. if you're out there and you're running a summer meal site and this is the first time you're learning about this, uh, I think the word from Jana is to apply. Uh, go ahead, check it out. Uh, she has her email there, Jana at cliffonline.org, and, and once again, we'll be sending out. Uh, I'll look to receive that from her, and I will send that application out with everyone. So, Jana, 
Uh, feel free to hang around on the line. Thank you so much for sharing about this important program. Okay, thank you, everyone. So we'll move on to the next one. Uh, and the New England Dairy and Food Council is another uh, organization. You may have heard of them from the Fuel Up to Play 60 program that they have partnered with the NFL on. So I don't know if they'll be able to get professional sports players everywhere they go this summer, but they do have equipment grants for school food authorities uh, that can be applied to summer meal programs. Uh, they have, uh, in speaking with staff there, they have indicated this, this money can be used for milk coolers and insulated bags, uh, promotional materials, uh, and other things that would improve participation, like grills, picnic tables, carts, and signage. So this is some significant funding. I actually don't know exactly how much it is, um, but this is funding available to Vermont Summer Food Sponsors for, for, for uh, equipment and uh, other promotional materials for the program. Just note that a uh, school food authority must be enrolled in the Fuel Up to Play 60 program to receive a grant. We'll have more information on how to sign up in just a moment. Um, they are also able to provide specific support for summer kickoff events. So once again, Nancy, we were talking about the importance of those summer kickoff events or uh, a blitz maybe in the middle of the summer to remind people about summer meals. The New England Dairy and Food Council uh, is wanting to connect with summer meal sponsors in the state. They have a Fuel Up to Play 60 truck with giveaways, nutrition trivia, games, a fun photo op, and a cow mascot. So I haven't seen a picture of the cow mascot, but I'm sure it's a pretty, uh, a pretty good draw. So um, they have more enrichment resources. Uh, NewEnglandDairyCouncil.org has menu ideas for uh, programs, nutrition educational resources, and dairy farm to school. So, uh, you know, New England Dairy and Food Council has a lot of resources for summer meal sponsors that might be looking for that extra push this year, especially around kickoff, uh, especially around uh, uh, grant funding and enrichment resources. So, and, and again, this is connection in a lot of different areas. So not only are they interested in getting kids to be active, but also there's a connection to where does food come from. Mm -hmm. There's an interest with connecting to farmers and milk and cows and, and the local region. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of angles and dimensions that they are offering. Definitely. So if you would like more information about this program, uh, Jill Goodrow is your contact at the New England Dairy and Food Council. Uh, also, she uh, let me know that if you want to join the Fuel Up the to Play 60 program, uh, she is the contact here in Vermont. So if you'd like to learn more, about this funding, about this support, please contact Jill Goodrow, 802-863-5416, uh, or jgoodrow at newenglanddairy.com. Unfortunately, Jill was not able to be with us today. She really wanted to be, uh, but was away. Uh, I will be sending out this information with her contact, uh, her contact uh, in uh, an email after this webinar. So, and finally, would like to announce uh, a grant funding that's available through the American Academy of Pediatrics. Nancy, this is with the Vermont chapter. They actually have just sent me a final summer meal program RFP uh, request for proposal. They are going to be uh, seeking to fund 20 summer meal sites with grants ranging from $250 to $750 uh, to fund equipment and outreach. Uh, they are also hoping to pair pediatricians with summer meal sites to become summer meal champions and to provide interactive sessions for nutrition and physical activity. Uh, this grant application, Nancy, is actually going to go out as an attachment uh, in a follow-up email after this webinar. We also are going to try to distribute this through the Summer Food Listserv to the Vermont Agency of Education. They, uh, summer meal sponsors and sites have until April 30th to fill this out. Oh, I'm going to quit. Yeah, I would like to note this is a very easy RFP. It is actually one page. So, uh, Nancy, there's there's no reason not to put your name in the hat. This is, this is uh, crazy good. I'm almost more excited about the pediatrician connection because they are natural summer food ambassadors. So if we're talking about partnerships, we're talking about finding people who really understand what the program is about, what it represents, what it can do for the community, expanding that to more people. I can't think of a better person than a pediatrician. Think of all the kids that they meet. Think of all their other social connections in the community, understanding what summer food's about, that it's available, that it has um, the goal to reach kids, to, to give them healthier lives, to feed them during the summertime, all those different things. This is just amazing. That's great. So there are lots of great opportunities out there. And, and, and following up on that, just want to ask another question of our audience, uh, another poll question to see how many partnerships are already going on out there. So I'm going to ask the question to everyone. 
Uh, please take the next 30 seconds or so to answer this question. Uh, have you already partnered with one or more local organizations in, uh, as part of your summer meal program? We'd love to hear uh, never, yes, once a long time ago. Uh, we tried but couldn't find anyone interested or partnerships are key to our success. So please take a few more minutes, or excuse me, about 10 more seconds, and then we'll get the results of our poll. I don't know, Derek, I think we're preaching to the choir here. Yeah. We got some non-voters. Come on, yeah. vote out, vote out. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what you can see about participants mm. when you uh, look okay. at this, this tool. OK, so we're going to go ahead and publish our results. Uh, Close the poll, and we will share the poll. All right, looks like everyone believes that partnership <laughs> for key to our success, which is great. Uh, that's wonderful. And so uh, we're glad to hear that people feel that way. Whether it's completely true or whether it's just something you're aspiring to, we definitely agree with you that those are very important. Uh, so once again, uh, just, to, just to give everyone a bit of an idea of what's the timeline for doing outreach, Nancy. Uh, really, now is the time to start establishing some details about your program. You don't have to know everything right now, but thinking about when are you planning to offer meals this summer? Uh, what are your priorities? Are you going to be able to deliver meals? Are you going to be able to? Um, are you going to need people to come pick up meals from you? Uh, and which meals do you plan to offer? Are you going to try to offer breakfast and lunch? That's often what we want to encourage folks to do: is to maximize the, the amount of food they're able to serve, to maximize the reimbursement. Uh, thinking a little bit about the capacity that you have as a summer meal sponsor can allow you to then approach potential partners and funders to engage in a conversation about what you can provide. Because really, when you're looking for those partnerships, you want to be able to communicate an idea of what you can offer to them so that they can then buy in and use the meal program as a great connection with their activities. So I'm thinking, you, it, this is late in a way, because when I think about partnerships, I'm thinking about conversations before either party has solidified what they're planning to do. So you don't want to come in so late approaching a partner where they've said, no, we've already got too many people, we can't change our schedule. You want to come in early where if they need to change their programming a little bit to accommodate meals or vice versa with the meal preparation, you want to be able to allow for that and work it in with all the other scheduling and logistics and whatnot. So I think um, the partnership um, discussions need to start early now from the end of when do we have to have agreements solidified with the state. Well, that's not until the beginning of June. But I think getting there takes some time. Those conversations, reaching people, giving people a chance to mull things over, talk to you know, the people they have to go back to in their organizations, all of that does take time. So you need to allow for that. So, so what I'm hearing you say, Nancy, is, is what we see here on this sheet, you know, this is part of a, these are not just things that you check off on a list, it's a part of a conversation yes, that you're having absolutely. with people. Yeah, so yeah. The, the way that you do that is really approaching folks. You may have in mind an idea of, I really want to work with the library this year. Uh, I think the senior center might be interested. I don't think the rec department offered meals last year. You know, think about, ways that you can connect your program, your meal, meals program to children and families, ways you might be able to expand it. Uh, and then it's really time to think about next steps to connect with partners, to expand service, to secure funding, et cetera. And Nancy and I, we realize that can be a little complicated sometimes. So if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. We have our uh, contact information at the beginning and the end of this webinar. Uh, that's really what we're here for, and, and we realize that's a lot of where the need is because um, having a program be successful uh, in terms of participation and in terms of the finances, uh, a big part of that is really connecting it to the wider community, and we're happy to help out with that. And if you are looking for more ideas, if you're looking for some more capacity, if you're looking for some more de professional development, uh, Nancy, I'm going to let you speak about this, but there's a great opportunity coming up here at the end of the month in early well, April. Well, and it's also required because yeah. sponsors need to go to training every year. So we're having our <laughs> um, annual spring conference in Montpelier, and you should all have gotten on, sent to your email. So we sent it out over our summer food list service. You did not get an email about registering for the From the Kids Perspective conference on April 2nd let me or Derek know, and we'll make sure you get um, a link sent to you for the registration website. 
So that's a time when there's going to be not only summer food people, but child care center people, a lot of rich sharing going on, multiple simultaneous workshops from basic to more sophisticated um, concepts. And you know, one of the thoughts about as you're learning or trying to think through an idea, I wanted to, to say about the planning and the timing, you want to leave time to um, test out assumptions. When you're going into discussions, you may assume, oh, nothing's happening. You know, you want, you want to give yourself a chance to discover the unknown and don't just assume you know it. And that takes a little bit of time. So um, along with that is connecting to other people who may have done something similar, had successes, that worked through some challenge in their own community. And at this conference, there are going to be lots of people. You're going to both be in sessions with them, but also, for instance, the Growing a Sustainable program has, I think, maybe like seven um, seasoned people who, sponsors, people who have run programs for years who are going to talk about different um, responses to barriers, questions, you know, things that they've worked through as they've learned to develop their programs. So there are, um, there are seasons presenters, there are peers, there's lunch time, there's break time, there's all you know activities to help you learn. So regardless of your learning style, there's something there for you and we encourage you to come for that training. It's way better than me or Derek alone talking to you. Yeah, there's going to be a number of opportunities to connect with people who uh, run programs, people who have made mistakes, who have learned from them, who have improved their programs. They're going to be many, many opportunities for learning there. So yeah. really encourage folks to yeah. come. And so if you haven't see, gotten the link yet to the website, you need to get that so that you can see more about what these individual classes, you may not know right off the, um, from looking at the title, what is Kids in the Kitchen and whatever. So the website will explain a little more in the time frame of that day. It's fairly um, inexpensive. And can you, if you'll forward me that link, Nancy, I'll make sure it goes out in the email. Sure, of course. Be great. Also, um, uh, two more opportunities to join us uh, online here. We have two more webinars in our Summer Meals uh, webinar series. Tuesday, April 14th, will be Get in the System, Sponsor Paperwork Made Easy. This is one day before the uh, deadline to submit your intensive to participate form. So this is a good timing for that. So that will be a day for you to make sure you understand what the next steps are to uh, manage the online system with the Agency of Education. And then on Wednesday, May 13th, we'll be talking about getting the word out, best practices for advertising and outreach. As we know, that last month uh, before the program gets started and then those first few weeks after it has begun are really critical to making sure folks in the community know about the service you're offering, about the connection to exciting uh, opportunities for learning and physical activity. So our final webinar in May will be focused on advertising, outreach, and, and general community awareness. Yeah, because you can create the best program ever, but if people don't know about it, if the kids don't come to the numbers, it's just not going to work for you. It's not, you're not going to be motivated to do it. So you want to, um, especially for open sites, and I know this isn't um, the same issue for those who already have a, a set group of kids and activities, but especially for open sites, you really want any possible family to know about your site. That's right. So we're going to open up the lines now. I know we've covered a lot of ground, but would just uh, love to uh, say that if anyone wants to, oh, here we go. We've got a question from, uh, looks like, Angelique. You can pull that whole bar right out, yeah, too, no, that's right. and make it so we can see. There we go. All right. So let's see here. Got a couple of questions. Let me get the questions out. Someone have, has written a question. You can stretch it out wider. Oh, we, we got go. a whole bunch yeah. of them. So, wow. do we see. automatically qualify? Stretch this wider so we can read more of the question let's all at once. See. There we go. Yeah. So, um, we have a question about Cliff. Do we automatically qualify for the 35% for Cliff if we're in a 50% or higher free and reduced percentage? So, I'm going to uh, defer to Jana on this one. Jana Brown, a program manager at Cliff. We have a question, uh, Jenna, from some, from a summer meal sponsor. If they are already operating uh, in an area that is 50% or more free and reduced, uh, do they need to provide other documentation to you about the eligibility? Uh, no, I think that that basically I always encourage people to put as much information as possible into their application. But if you don't necessarily have statistics on the individual kids participating in your program. Um, if you provide general statistics for either, you know, that school district or that particular area, um, that's certainly sufficient as well. That's great. Okay. 
Wonderful. Uh, I'm also, once again, encourage you to write in questions if you have any. We'll also unmute some of the lines here uh, to see if folks have any other things they would just like to say offhand. So um, I'm unmuting everyone's line. Uh, would anyone, anything else they'd like to add uh, about this topic or any other questions maybe for any of our presenters? Maybe we should let Angelique speak. Unmute her because she made that other people can't see all these questions. Um, Oh, she doesn't have yeah. her audio. Oh, sorry about that, Angel. But let me read what she's saying. My children love Cliff Days at their summer camp. Um, what a great program. So yeah, <laughs> I think Angelique could speak, and she was sort of sound like that. Yeah, and I actually, I think it, it's a really a popular program, and I think, you know, that really that book giveaway is um, an incredible opportunity for families and communities yeah. and programs yeah. uh, in the area. So, wonder, are there any other questions out there uh, before we uh, don't want to keep you around too long, but I do want to make sure that we address all of the questions that folks might have. Any other thoughts out there? Any other thoughts out there? We have everyone's line unmuted. Uh, well, I just I would like to thank Angelique for that amazing feedback. We definitely love to hear comments like that. Wonderful. Uh, all right. Any final thoughts? Well, well, just, you know, if you leave and then you think, oh, how does this apply to my particular thing or how to fit something in, just contact me or Derek and one of us will get back to you as soon as we can and help you out. We know um, we know you're busy trying to get things going, and, but we really want to be here to help. And we, you know, because of the, the positions that we're in, we hear about programs all across the state, so we can provide you, connect you with um, with resources and people who have had some experience that maybe you're trying to learn about. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we can emphasize that enough, that if you have a question or if you don't know what to do next, or even if you, you do but you want some help with that, uh, just give us a call or a, a write us. And Nancy and I, are, we work closely together, and we're also happy to help you any way that we can. So once again, uh, we'd like to just uh, sign off and really uh, genuine heartfelt thanks to our partners uh, that really make this uh, even more interesting Thanks so much to Jana uh, from the Children's Literacy Foundation, uh, Jana Brown, Chad Ummel, the Waterbury Rec Director, Frank Fisher over at the Barton Senior Center and Library, uh, and also if they weren't able to attend today, I would like to thank uh, Jill Goodrow from the New England Food and Dairy Council and uh, uh, Stephanie Winters and Barbara Frank for working with uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics. So uh, I want to thank everyone. Frank. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Sound there. So, Chad and Jana, thank you so much for um, for joining us today. And want to say to everyone, thanks for tuning in. And we look forward to being in touch. We will see you in April second at the training in Montpelier, and then again later on in April for our uh, next to find, next to last webinar on paperwork. Have a nice day. This is Frank. Hi, you. This is Frank at the Barton Senior Center. I want to thank Nancy and Derek and Jana, and uh, We'll look, we're looking forward to this summer's program. Thank you. Wonderful. Right, thank you. So are we. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank Bye. you.